Okay. Yeah, thanks. Right, okay. Some very quick points. Um, I've only got 15 minutes. Other people are going to deal with geopolitical aspects of this. I'm not going to. I'm going to deal on what I consider the most urgent question, which is that there are in fact two strategies for fighting the coronavirus. Okay. I'm going to use a lot of numbers. Don't worry about taking them all down because I will put the presentation into the chat afterwards so you can download all the numbers. Um, and I can't deal with all the questions verbally, but I'll try to deal with the questions in chat. Right, now let me try to do this. Okay, yeah, right. it's there. Okay, right, fine. Just very briefly, this is just my Learning from China website, and you can follow me on Twitter. Obviously, coronavirus is the most general peacetime crisis since World War II. There are going to be minimum hundreds of thousands of deaths, millions if not rapidly brought under control. It's going to produce the greatest economic downturn since the Great Depression. It's going to have profound changes in global ideology and politics. But I want to stress we are not foredoomed. That's the thing which I want to stress in this. The coronavirus shows that responses to it, that hundreds of thousands of millions of lives can be saved. It depends on the right policy choices being taken. And I want to show why China is by far the most successful country with a major output to deal with the coronavirus. Therefore, this is literally a life and death issue affecting hundreds of millions of people to learn from China. Okay. Some countries, such as Vietnam, were able to deal with the coronavirus by closing their borders happily. I'm not going to deal with these. I'm only going to analyze countries which had major domestic outbreaks. Okay. There are two strategies in in for dealing with the coronavirus. The first is to let the virus die out, which is via eliminating the spread, because the virus can't live outside of a living being. That's the strategy in China. The second is the herd immunity, which comes in various variants. The difference in the two between the two is in the minimum hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of lives, and with a huge effect on the economy. So China's approach and other some other countries is the total priority to saving lives, which means essentially eliminating the spread of the virus and domestic transmission, and then when that's achieved, to reopen the economy. The herd immunity strategy involves accepting tens of hundreds of thousands of deaths in individual countries and hundreds of thousands globally, and forcing people back, ordinary people back to work under conditions of great risk. Some countries are tempting half and half. Uh, I'm going to show why it won't work. Um, it's, which follows from the dynamics of the virus itself. It's unnecessary to be a medical expert to understand this difference. It follows from the fundamental features of the coronavirus and the strategies which are being followed. Okay. China's strategy is to eliminate the virus. That means the goal of zero domestic transmissions. That means the maximum saving of lives, and when that is achieved, then the economy can be safely reopened. It's like, in a sense, the method of dealing with SARS, of course, only on a much larger scale. Just a technical point, um, as there was a revision uh, which came out two days ago of the upward number of deaths in Wuhan, um, I want to make clear share that all the numbers from China are adjusted to include that, that adjustment. It's unclear at the time of writing if the WHO data also includes an underreported deaths in New York, so it's possible the U US figure may be slightly too low. The decisive thing of China is it showed it's possible to control the coronavirus. This shows the dynamic of the number of cases in China between the lockdown in Wuhan, which was on the 23rd of January, and the peak of transmissions, which came in the report on the 5th of February. This means, and that was at 3,887. That means in 12, for 12 days, the, it, after 12 days, it was possible to stop the virus numbers rising. It then took a further six weeks for China to achieve the first day in which there were zero new cases. That means that the coronavirus could basically be got under domestic control in eight weeks with the correct policies. This also meant that the number of deaths was kept limited. I've taken a seven day average because deaths move around a lot on a day to day basis. The peak death toll was 176, which was on the 19th of February. That means nothing like the thousands of cases a day that you have seen in the west 176 was the maximum 
and it's now been reduced down in the last period there is now an average of one one death a day that means that the virus is basically under control uh, there is still a risk to china significant risk from imported cases this is showing you at the present time up to the 16th of april there are 59 uh average 59 cases a day that are imported this is still a risk and china has to control it through quarantine the number of domestic cases, however, has averaged over the last period only six per day. That means, again, the situation under control. If you have that, you can trace all the contacts and other people. Okay. Uh, China with is now beginning to reopen its economy. But the decisive things in China is the number of cases is close to zero. This means it's totally different, for example, what's being done in Spain. In Spain, when they announced the opening up of the economy, on 16th of April, there were 5,092 new cases and 523 new deaths on that day. If in conditions of a country with thousands of new cases and hundreds of deaths a day, lockdown is lifted, there is a very great danger of the resurgence of the coronavirus. So, there are speakers here from China who can speak in much greater detail, obviously, about the, how the lockdown was done in China, but for Western Russia, Western readers, there's an excellent article about it, which I've given a, a, a reference to here. Okay. Also, there are very good comments by some Western authors. There was an excellent comment by the editor of the Lancet referring to Britain, but, but appropriate for other countries. China, when the government realized that a new virus was circulating, Chinese officials didn't advise hand washing, the better cough etiquette and disposing of tissues, they quarantined entire cities and shut down the economy. And we know, of course, that China took a tremendous economic hit in doing this. This shows, in my opinion, what was the decisive thing. This shows the decisive effects of the lockdown in Hubei province, which took place on the 23rd of January. What's showing is that basically you had an enormous outbreak in Hubei, that's the 55.7, and very, very small outbreaks in the other provinces in China. Basically, therefore, they locked the virus into Hubei by the, by the lockdown. This, in contrast, shows the situation in the US. Because there was no lockdown, the virus was able to spread throughout the country, and once that had occurred, it becomes impossible to control. This, in my opinion, this lockdown in Hubei was the most single most decisive action that was taken in the whole situation in China. I just want to note that this was... This absolute decisive action, which saved tens of thousands of lives, condemned by organizations such as Human Rights Watch. If their advice had been followed, there would be tens of thousands of people in debt in China already. Okay. Essentially, the lockdown, therefore, must continue until the virus is essentially eliminated in China. Otherwise, what you have is merely a slow herd immunity. That is, the number of deaths will be very high, but merely spread out over time. Um, China's dealing with the coronavirus has been, therefore, by far the most successful in the world, as I showed you. Basically, it took eight weeks to get the situation under control by a total lockdown. In the West, the response is nothing like as successful as we see. And there are deliberate or unintended, I'm not going to try to speculate whether some, some are deliberate, some are unintended, um, attempts in the West to conceal this. I'm not going to deal here with stupid propaganda and unjustified claims. I'm merely going to look at um, serious attempts to deal with the situation and, and consider these. One is a very big mistake which has been made, for example, by the Financial Times, um, which is uh, put, put in, in some sense is putting out very serious material, but it refuses to deal with the situation in per capita terms. This, therefore, is totally misleading because if you compare the number of deaths in a cut Spain and the of the number of deaths in China or the United States will get very misleading. I'm just going to show you how misleading it is by taking a case of China and South Korea. I've taken South Korea because South Korea is a relatively successful country, as we'll see, not as successful as China, but nevertheless better than other countries. This shows what happens if you look at the deaths, if you present them in the way that the Financial Times is doing, or no, sorry, in the way that you do it just in terms of absolute numbers. Mainland China, 4,632, South Korea, 229. It looks like um, South Korea is successful and China's not. If you use the method which the Financial Times is using, of using log scale, which is better because it shows you the growth rate, then you can see that the 
growth curve in South Korea is higher than the growth curve in mainland China. But the problem is that the population of China is 37 times bigger than the population of South Korea, or South Korea is 137. If you look it into per capita deaths, you can see the situation is exact, the exact reverse. The number of deaths per million in China is 3.3, and in South Korea, 4.4. That actually means, in real terms, the impact of the virus is 33% worse in South Korea than in China. This is why it is absolutely vital to understand the impact of the virus to do all the calculations in per capita terms. Right. Now, let's look at some of the countries that have held up success. Um, I'm going to add them. One which has held up a success in Europe, probably the most successful, is Germany. But in Germany, it has 43 deaths per million compared to 3.3 in China, therefore. So it's more than 10 times as bad, the situation in Germany. And that's the biggest success. If you look at the cases of the US and UK, the situation is far, far worse, as you can see. The US, 78.1 deaths per million. The UK, 191 deaths. This means the situation is about 60 times as bad in Britain as it is in China in the terms of the real impact of the virus. And then I'm going to go, then you can go on, of course, and look at the real catastrophe countries, which are well known. I, I use the US and UK because they're bad, but they're, Everybody knows the situation in Spain and Italy is absolutely disastrous. This is showing you the situation in the UK, it's showing you in France, Italy, Spain. These numbers, this means that, for example, the situation in Spain is not, is a hundred times as bad as the situation in China from the point of the impact of the virus. In Italy, it's more than a hundred times as bad. Okay. Here, what I've done is I've shown you two different ways of showing you. So you can to show the relative impact of the virus and the pandemic, you can either take it the cumulative death per million of the population, which I put in the right column, or for Chinese author, audience, particularly may understand the relationship to China. If there was the same number of deaths per million in the US, for example, as in China, there would be 541,700 deaths compared to the 4,632 which actually happened. That means it's 100 times as bad, okay? Sp Sp Spain, 558,000. All these indicates that the impact of the virus in the West is hugely bigger than the inf effect, effect in China. And this is being concealed. Let's look at it another look at what is happening here. This is showing you using the logarithmic scale on the y-axis, this shows you the rate of increase of deaths. It can be seen in, the, in some of the Western countries, this is beginning to slow down, thankfully. As you can see, you can see Spain is slowing down, Italy is slowing down, the US is not that slowing down so much, but it is slowing down some. But the, and this is correct, and this is often quoted, and people say that the numbers are is slowing down. This is correct. This is showing you that what I would call the partial lockdowns, which are happening in the West, are having an effect. They're reducing the increase. But the trouble is that the numbers are much, much too high to safely lift the lockdown. This John, is you've got a couple of minutes left, John. I'm going to, I'm going to be finishing a couple of minutes. Don't Fantastic. Worry. Thank you. Right, okay. This is showing you the major countries. You can see the, work, the situation at the present time, the 7% daily increase in deaths is worst in the US, second worst in the UK. A new and very disturbing development, which may be the next horrible thing of the pandemic, is you are beginning to get very rapid increase in deaths in very large developing countries. If you see Russia, 19.2% increase, India, 14.2% increase. Spread of the virus into these countries will, of course, affect uh, bil billions of people. Finally, just to exactly the last point. Right, okay. Right, what are the conclusions? To safely lift the lockdown, the number of domestic cases has to be reduced to essentially zero, which is China's strategy. The number of, ca of cases and deaths coming to, is coming down in other countries from a much higher level. If the lockdown is lifted in these conditions, there is a very great danger of resurgence. State aid has to be put in to enable people to sustain a prolonged lockdown. 
The severity in the West is greatly underestimated and understated, but is not expressed in per capita terms. Conclusion, it's vital for the world and humanity to follow the China strategy, not the one which is being pursued in the West. End.